Bless God, right now I wanted to do a quick video and I wanted to teach that vows is what makes a marriage. Okay, the consummation surrounds the marriage bed. Okay. However, the consummation does not make the covenant. Okay, the covenant is made on the vows. Okay. And in the Bible, the vows is the espousal. Okay. And... This is what we see in the New Testament that we're espoused to Christ as a chaste virgin. So if you take the language, okay, and we apply it to what is indeed a spiritual covenant, okay, coming into salvation, into Jesus, okay, the body of Jesus, this is important, is spiritual, okay, and this is indeed the new covenant, okay? And now you're a chaste virgin, okay? So you're in the body of Jesus, okay? So it's spiritual. So they too shall be one flesh, okay? Paul talks this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and there's a reason why he does, because when you come into Jesus, there is that espousal. The covenant has been made, okay? But this is why he also teaches, if you go to the harlot, you become one with the harlot. Not because just sleeping with a harlot in life means you're married to her. Okay, no. But what this means is that you've spiritually died. So now the covenant with Christ is gone. Okay. Because covenants are till death. The salvation covenant is spiritual, yes, and it's till death. If you die spiritually, it's over. Okay, so you depart from Christ, and now you go to be one with the harlot. You've made a covenant with death, and now you're at agreement with hell. Okay. So that's what that means. And that's why in Revelation 19, we see the consummation language given. Okay. So that's where you find the consummation language, okay, in this set up here okay but today we are one with Jesus in this covenant okay so that's a standard and a spiritual now we look at the physical here in Genesis chapter 2 we see it here that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her on to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked and there's no and. The man and his wife were not ashamed. Okay, so. What we see here is that Adam does make a profession. She shall be called woman. Okay. What you have here is that, and this brings back a really good point that someone had made to me in the past, that when you break it down like this, this makes it clear cut that the vows is what makes the marriage. Okay. So for a man and a woman to be naked... Okay, not be ashamed. They have to have vowed to each other. Okay, and this is what we see in Genesis. They were first made one flesh by God before they had relations with each other. Okay. They were not ashamed. Now, think about this. When a man and a woman come together, okay, in the marriage bed, okay, then there had to have been something preceding that to make the marriage bed lawful, okay? And that's the vows, okay? So it's the vows that make two one flesh, okay? So then when they go into the marriage bed, it's a lawful relationship, okay? If there wasn't something preceding over this prior, 
then the act is fornication and it's sin. Okay. However, that's not the case. If the vows are lawful before God, then they're one flesh. Okay. And that's why it's upon vowing. Okay. There's other things I could bring up here as I go. Okay. And so again, those are the big examples, okay, that I would start with, okay. We have a few in the Torah here that could be brought up, okay. Right now I'm going to go to Exodus 22, okay, and bring up a few other things. Espousal and betrothal are the same if they're translated properly, okay. There is places in the Torah where we see betrothed and it's not the proper translation, okay. And that is something that you have to be aware of. There's underlying Hebrew words, and it's a more lengthy conversation. But it's a conversation that can be had, okay? In this video, I'm only trying to prove that the vows is what makes the marriage. So the vows is what makes the betrothal, okay? And that is what makes two one flesh, because now it's illegal before God. It's of the lawgiver it's of God and you do not need witnesses we go back to the Garden of Eden who was there no one okay so you don't need witnesses witnesses is good it's not wrong to have a witness to these things but you don't need them and you'll need the state okay and these things that's just the point here okay I might bring up some other things as I get through this though because there's a reason why people ask this, okay? Sometimes, and sometimes it could be other reasons, but Exodus twenty two sixteen: If a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. Okay, so here, the woman's not betrothed, okay? So then the Torah says that this man, he has to do the right thing now, okay? It does not mean they're married, Okay, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. Okay, so this could be looked at in different ways, but you're trying to get to a place where there could be an actual vows to make this legal. Okay, if her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of the virgins. Okay, so it does not make the marriage. Anyone that's saying that the sex alone makes the marriage is teaching something contrary to the Bible. Okay, and this teaches, though, that there's no betrothal. There's obviously a sin involved, and now you got to try to make it right, and you have to try to do the marriage the right way. Okay, and the father stepped in here and did not allow it in this certain case. Okay, and here we have... In Deuteronomy 22, we have a good example. Okay. This is really good, actually. Deuteronomy 22, verse 23. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out under the gate of that city, and you shall stone them with stones that they die. Okay. It's treated like adultery. And why is that? Because... The woman was betrothed. She was another man's. That's legal. Okay. And then we see the word here. He humbled his neighbor's wife. There's uh, possession. It's the man's wife. His neighbor's wife. You know. It was a woman betrothed. Okay. So it's treated as adultery would be treated. Okay. In this case. It's an adultery against the vows. Okay. Now you have a real technicality here. Which is. I wouldn't call it a technicality. It's technical, maybe, is the right way to say it. That you have to look at adultery or fornication on what it's against. Is it against the vows only or is it against the bed? You know, what are we talking about? Okay. 
once a woman has entered the marriage bed with a man, okay, then she's not really even considered a woman espoused, really. They're already in the marriage bed, okay, and they're already living together, okay. She's not a virgin anymore, okay. That's why the Bible talks about fornication, okay, and that's why there is this particular sin in the writing of divorce. Because you would not need a writing of divorce. I'll mention this. I think this is fair. And I'm going to get back to Deuteronomy 22. But you would not need a writing of divorce if there was not an already established vow before God that they were married. Okay. Because the problem occurred in the marriage bed. Okay. So there had to been a standard to make the union lawful, and then the problem to be something that is given through a verdict of God, permissible by the Torah, that if the woman's found to not be a virgin, okay, was the problem, okay, and that's why it's saving for the cause of fornication, because the woman was a fornicator against the marriage bed, but against the vows, I mean, that's really just being adulterous, you know, in that sense. Okay, and this is why you find a close link to the words as well, like in the prophets, okay? It really comes down to what are we talking about, okay? If you've made a vow with a man, okay, till death do you part, okay? You're already a woman who's in that sense married, okay? And... What we see in the Torah and what we see in the scriptures that sometimes there was a lengthy period of time in between the espousal and the consummation. If you were in that period of time go to be with another man, you're in a sense guilty of fornication because it's against the marriage bed. That's the difference. Okay. There are some that just want to make adultery and fornication mean the same thing. But they don't. They do give us particulars. Okay, and they help explain to us particulars. But if you vow to do that, and you're already married in that sense. So in that sense, yeah, you want to call someone an adulterer for that, you could. I mean, in that sense. But as far as the sexual act of the marriage bed, it's why we have the difference between fornication and adultery. Okay. Now, here we have... If we go down, for example, so we saw the verdict in the case with the woman betrothed, just stone him. Now, it does talk about the woman crying out in case she was raped or something, okay? In this case, they feel comfortable knowing that this was not rape, it was consensual act, the woman shall be stoned, okay? Because she had a husband and she went with another man, okay? So is treated basically like adultery. Okay, so in Deuteronomy 22, verse 28, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lie with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. Okay, so the point is, the act, the very act, the consensual act of intercourse you have here as you did above a couple verses in the chapter. However, the difference is that there was a woman who was betrothed and a woman that was not. So it's the betrothal that has the legality over the situation and now it adds the emphasis and it heightens the situation. If you sleep with a woman betrothed, you sleep with a woman that has been vowed. Okay, And this woman now it's like sleeping with her. It's like sleeping with a woman that's been married for 10 years. Okay, you're going to be stoned. In a case of a woman who's not betrothed, okay, there does need to be some recourse for this. There has to be some situation brought forth with the woman's father. And so we see in Exodus 22, one way it could go. And then we see in Deuteronomy 22, another way it can go. But there is Torah, there is law surrounding how to operate it back in Israel. So now you're going to ask me maybe a question, what am I going to do today? Well, 
you have to come to me with the exact situation. Then we have to see what God provides for an answer because you get all these different situations. Listen, if two people are about to be married till one of them gets sick, that doesn't count. Okay. That's not of God. Okay. I have to go by God's standard. As long as two people vow, you know, we just make it simple. Try to make it as simple as possible. If two virgins vow to be married till they die, you're stuck till you're dead. Okay. Until one of those people is in the ground dead, you ain't allowed to go with anyone else. And that's, that's the doctrine of God. Okay. And that's the teaching of scripture. Okay. However, if someone makes their own vows that's contrary to the law of God, then the law of God's not going to sanction it. The law of God's not going to sanction something like this. Okay? The law of God sanctions what God has said. Okay? And that's why the law of God does not sanction remarriage. Okay? Because there are some people that say, I've been remarried, you know, and I don't want to get out of this marriage because of the covenant. And you guys are teaching false teachings. Okay? And no one submits to those teachings, okay, in the church. Because it's contrary to the doctrines of Scripture, okay? So there's all these different questions. One thing I have seen come up in the past, though, this was a while back, is that someone said and spoke about how, you know, they vowed to be married, but they never consummated. Am I bound to this marriage? You're getting into all these different things that pertain to maybe some people getting married for, you know, citizenship. Uh, some people getting married because of a scheme. Some people getting married because of all these different things, okay? So you signed a bunch of papers with a wicked, filthy government. I don't care about that. That doesn't, that's just being, to be honest with you, that's just, and I talked about this in a video that I don't even know if I have on YouTube yet, but I'm going to, God willing, at some point. It's like you get mixed up with Caesar in something that is of God. It's not right, okay? You shouldn't do that. those sort of things, okay? This marriage is particular with God. You don't need to get some, you know, bunch of wicked rich men involved in your business, okay? It's just not right, okay? You know, we're in the world, but we need to be kept from evil. You cannot be of the world, okay? Now, I understand people are ignorant of these things. They want to try to do what's right before God and all these different things. I can understand the possibility for that in this case, but you need to turn from that because you need to start giving people proper advice, okay? You need to be an ally for your neighbors, okay? You're just getting mixed up now. Citizenship and all these different things. What does that even mean to God? What does that even mean to God? We're read about people being strangers, okay? Even Abraham, who had the promises, he was a stranger. You know, what does this even mean? You know? You just fall under the syndrome of best life now. Despite the fact that you don't think that you live that, that's what you're doing. You're just looking for your best life now. You're just looking to try to cut every corner, make everything as easy as possible. Listen, if you're free, use it, okay? I'm not telling you not to. But when you have to try every last little thing in life to make this life better, you're going to lose it, okay? Rather, what you need to do right now is just lose your life so you can find it then, okay? And that's what you need to do. And then you're going to think, you know what? None of these things are really worth it, okay? So, yeah, so this is what some people say. I've vowed, okay, but never consummated. Am I bound to this, okay? Well, yes, of course. You're bound to your vows. The Bible teaches that, okay? You vowed to another man, you know, that you would be married till death do you part. Whether or not you've had sexual intercourse, that's not God's law. God's law starts with the vows. God's law isn't waiting for the intercourse. In the scriptures, like I talked about before, the way the sin is communicated to us is differentiated between different cases and scenarios on whether you have entered the marriage bed. So God gave us these specifics so we may know what's going on in different cases, especially in Israel. It was most prominent in Israel, you know. 
And God reflects these different things to us in salvation because there is, for example, the espousal, which is looked at like marriage because there is a saying that is not pre-trib, but Jesus teaches this actually, that when he's come back from the marriage, okay, well, how could Jesus come back from the marriage if we also read that there's a marriage in Revelation 19? How can that actually work? So the pre-trib believers say that you're going to go up to heaven and there's going to be some sort of marriage up there and then there's going to be another one in Revelation 19. Okay. And, you know, no one actually taught that, but you might get that from, for example, I'll go to a place. Okay. In the gospel here, Luke chapter 12 and the word is wedding, not marriage, but it's the same Greek word. But I'll read this, okay? Luke twelve thirty six, And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Okay, blessed are those servants. Okay, so... He returns not from some sort of pre-trib, okay? That's not what he's talking about, obviously, because he's talking to what they would say is maybe Jews, okay? So this is the Jews that the Jews are told there's going to be a pre-trib rapture, but, you know, your salvation will come later or something like this and all these nonsensical teachings. The wedding here is in reference to the espousal. When the fullness of espousal reaches, okay, then he comes back for the marriage in Revelation 19. So you have espousal and you have consummation, okay? These are the two critical points here. Because if you look at Matthew 22, okay, this is in reference to Jesus here, okay? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and send forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not. Okay? So the same way he called the Jews, he calls in the New Testament. Okay? So, again, let's keep going. I'll go down to verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. Okay, so marriage and wedding, same Greek word here, G1062, so we have to discern the context. So here, the same way he called the Jews, he's calling now in the New Testament. Okay, so these, they were at one point bidden, okay? They were in this covenant, but they're not worthy, so we're, get rid of them. All right, so then they go out to the highways, and they get what they can find, okay? So then we get to the end. So they espouse other people. Even how Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 2, how it relates to Hosea 2, okay? There's a betrothal, okay? Now you have the one guy who doesn't have the proper garment on, which signifies the fact that he's in sin. It doesn't mean he gets left behind or something for seven years, no, what happens is he's bound hand and foot, and he goes into outer darkness, okay? So this is what happens when Jesus returns. People start going into hell, okay? So there's a spousal, which can be understood as marriage, of course. And then there's consummation, which is the marriage bed, okay? And the espousal is by a vows, Okay, and then Revelation 19, the consummation, okay, is a slaughter, okay? The vows that we work from in the espousal and salvation is, I think, between the Father and the Son, okay? And different questions might be asked here, but I think it's a high priestly, you know, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Okay, you are a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's a different question. The high priest marries the virgin and all these different things. Now, so in your life, you've been mating, given a vow with someone, okay? 
And then you never consummate for whatever reason. Are you bound to this? Absolutely. Okay. Hypothetically, say if you're a man. Okay. What does it say in the Torah here? Deuteronomy 20, verse 7. And what man is there that has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in battle and another man take her. This is the first thing you should be figuring out after you have vowed. See, in our society, people vow and the next set of circumstances is some lewd banquet, probably, of riotous living and drunkenness. And then there's the consummation. So it all seemingly happens in one day, okay? The 24-hour period, if you will, or something close to this, okay? Back in these times, it seemed different, okay? You know, even you look at David, who, you know, that was his wife. As long as this woman was alive, he already had a wife. Michal, Saul's daughter, okay? This was his technical wife, okay, this whole time. And all these other women, that's why we've been saying this was wrong, you know? But even David realized the legality of it, okay? For example, here we see in 2 Samuel 3, 14, And David sent messengers to ish Bashath, Saul's son, saying, Deliver my wife Michal, which I espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Okay? And so here... In this scripture, we see that David, he already had a problem with women, okay? You know, in he already understood things wrong. But he knows at this point that this is his lawful wife, okay? And for that, David understood the law. And David was trying to do right by the law in this point, okay? David wasn't always, you know steadfast if you will and however though in this situation he understood okay and that goes to prove to you that David understood the law okay and that also proves that espousal is by law okay and makes the law because David is claiming his lawful right to this woman okay and this woman already had another man, and that man didn't have any right. Okay, it's not just because of who David was, okay, it's because of the law of God, okay. And anyway, I think that's about the last part I'm going to bring up in this video, but yeah, there's that technical thing there going on in Luke 12 that the preacher and believers probably would use if they know that scripture is there, and they might enjoy trying to use that, but that's not what's going on. There's not this idea that you're going to be espoused and there's some sort of secret rapture into a secret consummation wedding feast in heaven. No, there's no teaching, you know, like that in the Bible. Okay. When we talk about this marriage, it comes with the destruction of sinners. That's what this feast is about. Okay, and that's what we read about in the scriptures. All these secret things into heaven, that's why they're called secret, because they're not in the Bible, okay? Why they call it secret is different, but like, that's where you get secret wills, Calvinism, you get all these secret things, you know? And we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, okay? We're talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the Messiah reigning on earth, and... This is that marriage consummation. Okay, right now they're going through the espousal process. The father and the son, they're going through the espousal process with, you know, someone who's a saint and they're looking for people faithful. That's why, you know, when a woman would not be found a virgin, it was such a problem, okay, in Israel because the woman did not remain faithful to her vows, okay. And we see the father being involved. And we have all these different figures and shadows. And we have these texts from Jeremiah 3. And then we have the land involved and all these different things. And they can be complex. I understand that part. But we all know deep down, if you have vowed to a person, that's what is of law. Okay, so you have vowed to be married till you die. So there's no reason not consummating. If you for some reason haven't, 
then that's what you need to be seeking, okay? If you have vowed to a man and he won't consummate, it's the same thing as if a man consummated with you and left. It's the same thing. Whether or not you've consummated doesn't mean you're not bound or not, okay? And in specific to our time without some of these more specific laws in Israel, there's really nothing to say here. You have to stick by what you vowed, okay? And I don't know, I guess a man vowed to you maybe, then he, you can't find him or something. I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, you'd have to talk to me about the exact situation and I don't have a problem talking to you about it, see if I can be of any help or support in any way, but that's the point. The point is, is that the vows is what makes the marriage, and that's the testimony of the scripture on this. Everywhere we look, okay, and that's why we're a chaste virgin waiting Christ, and we wait for Christ. Christ comes after the Antichrist, and we're going to be waiting till the end of the tribulation. And if we die in faith prior, that's good. But we still have to come back with Jesus for the marriage, okay? This is the marriage. They're already in heaven, they say, and they had a secret marriage with a secret rapture. They still got to come down here in Revelation 19 for the marriage. So I guess they get to be part of two of them, uh, the pre-trib believers. I don't know how this got to be a big part of it, but maybe a separate video in the future at God's timing. But anyway, so that's all I have to say about this. Praise God.